Good afternoon and welcome to a great conversation that we are about to have. Make sure to share this conversation on your social media. If you are in, you want to make sure that others are in this conversation with you. We are going to have a discussion um, with two dynamic women about an upcoming documentary film that is right on time, uh, that is relevant to this election and re relevant to this moment that we are in right now. My name is L. Joy Williams. I'm a national political strategist, host of Sunday Civics on Sirius XM, and also a whole bunch of other hats. <laughs> but for this conversation, I will be your captain guiding and moderating this conversation between these two women. And so I want to uh, uh, bring them into the conversation and waste no time. Again, make sure to share this information to have others join us. Um, first, we're going to talk about our discussion today is uh, talking about a new documentary film um, that will be in theaters or those of us who are still at home in quarantine. Um, <laughs> on our screens at home. And joining us are Liz Garbus and Lisa Cortez. Hi. 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 So I'm going to do all of the honorifics and everything and tell you that Liz is a two-time Academy Award nominee, a two-time Emmy winner, Peabody winner, and you have like a whole list of awards um, <laughs> that people should actually read, but you are renowned for creating electrifying and archival historical documentaries that take a deep dive into some of the hottest topics and issues that we are that are relevant to our society today. And Lisa Cortez, Cortez is also an Academy Award and Emmy nominated producer and director who is known for creating challenging visionary stories um, and empowering inclusive voices. Uh, Liz and Lisa, thank you so much for uh, making the time to join us for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start at the beginning, um, and we are talking about this documentary film that both of you um, uh, were on uh, and, and created. And I want to start by first uh, uh, giving for you both to give us a landscape on how this came to be. You want me to start? <laughs> well, there's two words on how it came to be, and those two are Stacey Abrams. Um, Stacey, um, you know, I mean, how it came to be is, you know, hundreds of years of history that have led us to this place that we find ourselves in today. Um, Stacey Abrams, about a year ago, um, had the idea that she wanted to help create and produce a documentary about voter suppression. She did not want it to be, or the right to vote, let's say more broadly, um, and the history of the right to vote in this country. Um, she did not want it to be a film about Stacey Abrams, about the Georgia race in 2018. She wanted us to, you know, what her passion was to look at the historical ebbs and flows of this right to vote, um, its expansion, its contraction, and, and in doing so, really understand where we are today. Um, I'll say one more thing before I turn it over to Lisa. You know, one of the things that Stacy said in the early part of our meeting was, you know, folks show up to vote. Maybe they've stood online for 15 minutes. Maybe it's been five hours. But when they get there, if they're turned away or they say their registration's not valid or somebody says they already voted absentee or somebody says, oh, we sent you a postcard. You didn't return it. You're not on the rolls. The person walks away and thinks this is this is on me. I did something wrong. Um, the bureaucracy is complicated. Um, not necessarily connecting it to hundreds of years of a very um, purposeful uh, campaign to keep the electorate quite small and um, limit the voices of black and brown and indigenous and young and poor people. Um, and especially now as our country becomes increasingly beautifully diverse, um, those tactics have become ever more uh, intense. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I think the what's at the heart of this film is that from the inception of this country, from our constitution, there have been structural inequities. There are inequities that limit who had the power to vote and who didn't. And the examination and the interrogation of this history is so important at this time. 
when there are a lot of fallacies about voting and and when you look at the long arc of the story, you see that there has been intentional obstructions that are a part of our history. I think this is really important. And I want to set the stage, uh, uh, both of you talking about how the film came to be. The film is all in the fight for democracy. Let's take a moment to look at the trailer now. If the power of the right to vote was truly made available to everyone in America, it would change the future of this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Stacey Abrams! When I started running for governor, we anticipated that voter suppression was going to be instrumental in Ryan Kemp's campaign, and we were right. We've been in line for five hours. They said, you've already voted. Looks like several days ago. No, I would have remembered that. Thousands of people were told no and didn't have the authority to demand better. The lines are insane. We had precinct consolidation, non-training of local election officials. I knew something had gone horribly wrong. The system that is supposed to protect our democracy didn't work the way it was supposed to. States implement voter suppression laws all across the country. Things like new voter ID laws purging. You're knocked off the roll. Gerrymandering. Changing the voting boundaries. Ohio is a use it or lose it state. In the United States, the right to vote is the only right you can lose simply for not using it. Jim Crow 2.0. That's what we're saying. We've got a lot of work to do. When we started as a country, 6% of people were eligible to vote. There are still forces that are determined to keep citizens from voting. Unless we fight for the right to vote, our democracy is put at risk. The fight over voting rights is ultimately about power. The states have figured out how to stop African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, the young and the poor from voting. History is never a straight line. It's always a fight. I will not concede because the erosion of our democracy is not right. We're trying to make history. The vote matters. You belong. You have value. <laughs> wow. <laughs> some, some trailers to the trailer, but um, so let me let me get some of the uh um, things about uh, the filmmaking out of the way. Is this the first time that the two of you have worked together? Yeah. Yeah, no, you would not be able to tell that from our green room banter <laughs> that we just had. Um but talk a bit about um, the learning process for uh, either of you um, in doing this film? What did you learn? What were you surprised to learn um, as you went through the process of directing this film? Hmm. Well, I think one of the, the greatest things I've learned is how technology became our friend. Um, you know, we finished our interviews in the beginning of March and this film is so timely and it had to be completed on a very specific timeline. The offices were closed and our editor was in Portugal. We had people in Georgia, New York, our animators in Berlin. And what I learned is that when people are united in telling a story that is so important, it doesn't matter about time zones and um, distance, but we all found an effective way to communicate, to come together and to create and share a very complex story um, with lots of archival and, and really kind of an engagement up to the very moment that we you know, inclusive of George Floyd's murder, 
Like we are made this a film of the moment, even though the moment was uh, separated us in disparate places. Mm -hmm. And Liz, you know, the film is being released in September, which would be um, just, you know, countdown weeks. Those of us who work in electoral politics, September is the countdown um, into election day in November. Um, you know, just to expand upon um, uh, uh, Lisa's conversation, why, wh why uh, is this important in this moment? Oh, well, you know, we're all we all know we're coming up on a really consequential election. Um, and, you know, we believe that voting rights should not be a partisan issue. We believe you should be able to vote if you vote Republican, Green Party, independent. You know, we believe you should be able to vote um, and that um, it's actually a right that the government should be servicing us as opposed to citizens having to jump through hoops in order to be able to have their voices heard in the election. Um, of course, voting rights has become incredibly polarized, which is sad. Um, and, you know, you see the reactions. Our, our trailer went out and uh, that you just showed. And, you know, there are so many folks lining up and applauding it. And then there are so many other folks who will just say, well, voter suppression doesn't exist. This is all a fallacy. Oh, you know, you just register and vote. And it's so clear that it needs to be seen, like people's stories need to be heard and felt, you know, both gubernatorial candidates in Georgia in 2018 showed up at the polls to vote. I'm talking about Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp, and both of them had problems. They happened to have uh, cameras on them. You know, Stacey was told she had already voted absentee. Brian Kemp was told his voter card was invalid. This should be a nonpartisan issue. Um, but in fact, it's become so polarized um, you know, that that is sad. I do hope that people can come to it with an open mind and watch it um, because it's about protecting all of our rights, not just Democrats um, or, you know, progressives. It, it, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Yeah. So the other thing I thought that was very impactful um, in the film, I say on my show all the time, you know, quite often we use um, uh, we say they don't want you to vote or they are trying to prevent you from doing this. And then that they becomes vague, faceless, you know, and so it becomes more of um, a rumor um, or something that people don't believe in. One of the uh, great things I think about what the film does is sort of put it very plainly, who is responsible for certain actions? Um, was that uh, on purpose? You mean naming names? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Calling people out? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that Stacy, you know, when, when we spoke with her said, like, let's put the human face on this story. Let's have people see themselves. And in keeping with what, you know, Liz mentioned at the top, it's, it, it's like when this happens, it doesn't just happen to you. It's happening to many people and it's concerted and it's weaponized. And so, it, you know, anything that we're naming is factual. Um, we spent a lot of time, you know, vetting information because um, this film should be a guide to a cautionary tale, but also with a lot of positive takeaways. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'll just add in terms of the question about naming names. I mean, it's pretty clear what the story is, right? You know, this country is founded um, when we, we are, when this country is founded, 6% about had the right to vote. We had this great language about democracy and, you know, breaking away from kings and all of this. And in fact, only 6% of the population was eligible to vote. And those were white male property owners, except in a few instances where, you know, maybe a, a black landed, pro, you know, northern man was able to vote, but but very few. Um, so, you know, we understand the racial aspect of voting, right, and the class aspect of voting right from the beginning. Um, of course, when slavery is abolished and you have free people, and you know, as states are resisting it, but uh, black Americans become citizens and are granted the franchise. There was this very, you know, interesting period of reconstruction. All of a sudden, black folks are getting elected to the Senate. They're becoming governors. And there's great voter participation. We see it during Reconstruction. Um, and then all of a sudden, 
uh, white power uh, is threatened in states uh, in like Georgia and Mississippi, where they're electing black folks to represent them. Um, and you know, this is the beginning of Jim Crow and of clan of white terror. Um, you know, then we have the VRA. You know, cut to you know 1965 and the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, and uh, but look, then there's a man named and you know, and there's progress again. Then there's a man named Barack Obama elected president. We see that same crackdown that we saw after Reconstruction. Um, yeah. So it's you know it's it's a pretty you connect the dots. It's pretty much a straight line. So it is about white power, and it is about having an electorate um, that you don't have to answer to. If your community isn't really voting and isn't being counted and is being suppressed, then politicians don't have to take care of your needs because they don't need to count on your votes. And that is what we see happening in this country. Yeah, you're, you're uh, very right. You can actually chart the course in this country that anytime we enfranchise more people and people begin to use all of the rights um, that they are entitled to, they're very uh, much immediately becomes this suppression, this uh, crackdown and terrorism. Um, that happens because voter suppression was also, you know, wrapped up in terrorism to black communities across the country. One of the stories in the film that I think was very powerful um, was about, a, a, you know, a black man who had served this country in the military comes back and was like, I, like, I served this country, I defended this country, you know, I can vote and sort of how um, his life was taken um, uh, because of a vote. Right, and sort of connecting that terrorism um, of, of voter suppression. It's used as that tactic. So um, racism, obviously, as we are uh, all talking about, is at the root of a voter suppression. Um, and uh, I want to um, talk a bit about uh, how um, you know, I believe they're related and intertwined, <laughs> you know, as you mentioned, of how to suppress um, the votes and the rights um, and uh, full rights and citizenship of folks in this country. But I wanted to uh, expand a little deeper and uh, ask you, was also the point of the film, because um, you mentioned uh, now Governor Kemp also showed up. Um, and couldn't vote, but that when you're suppressing other people, that there are these ripple effects that you're suppressing, you know, non-people of color as well. And sort of what do you hope, because um, quite often when people watch, you know, they call them civil rights films or, you know, suppression films or racism and sort of things like that, they think that's what they're doing to those people, um, rather than this is a problem that I, whether or not I'm a person of color, whether or not I'm a black person, um, should care about and how it would affect me. You know, well, Joy, we we we've moved from you know the the bully clubs and the and the dogs to being purged to mm -hmm. polls being closed. You know, I mean, the the weaponization is 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 stealth and it's tricky and it changes, but it still keeps showing up. Um, and when it shows up, it certainly is focused, but it doesn't discriminate in terms of the access. You know, if you are, have this target and you're in a community that the, the power structures want to uh, contain, you're going to get caught in the crosshairs. And I think that that's something that people need to understand is it's not just uh it, that it's so it's so inclusive in terms of the boundaries that can be put in terms of containing your right to vote mm -hmm. although you know they are quite purposeful in terms of voting place uh, polling places that get shut down i mean we look at what happened in georgia in 2018 and the communities that lost their polling places i think you know people should care about this even if they're white and it doesn't affect them. I mean, it's only it never taken me more than 15 minutes to vote where I live in Brooklyn. Um, but you should care about it because you believe you live in a democracy. <laughs> um, and yeah. And, but then when you're doing these big purges or when, you know, there are going to be white folks caught up in it too. I guess I just hope that white folks might care um, even if it doesn't actually directly affect them and their family. 
Yeah. You talk a, a lot about the research that was necessary so that you can make sure things were factual. Um, I know for a number of us who care about facts, um, it's really important to sort of um, have that work uh, put in. Was there anything that shocked you um, while doing the research for this film? Hmm. Well, I mean, un you know, unfortunately, it all fits the a pattern, right? Like the pattern that we talked about connecting the dots, it's pretty clear. And like Lisa said, okay, it's not the billy club or the hose, it's uh, a poll closure, or it's a um, exact match, which certainly will of, I, of signatures, which will trip up people at the polls and give poll workers distract discretion on whether or not a person can can go vote. Um, they, you know, it's it's like uh, the you know mailing a postcard if somebody's moved or, or throwing you know not looking at their mail. You know, a lot of folks who who live on the margins are are moving a lot. Um, you know, they're not going to be able to keep their ID up to date. Um, so. And then you look at things like, you know, voter ID laws and, and in Texas, and you see that, you know, a gun license uh, counts as an ID, but a uh, public housing ID will not. Um, so you look at those kinds of things, and and sometimes they're just so bold like like that, that they can be kind of surprising. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it usually it, it, you, when you're, you're looking, I mean, the story is, is pretty clear. I think what, yeah. what, what we've done though, Elder, in the film is we also talk about some great people with boots on the ground now. You know, whether it's Desmond Mead with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition and all the great work they've done with Amendment 4, or Barb and OJ Citizen, um, but Barb and OJ Siemens, you know, from representing the Native uh, American community or the, the young people at Lucha and what they're doing in Arizona in terms of mobilizing and speaking to their community. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, whether it's returning citizens, Native Americans, you know, Latinx folks, there has been so much that has been done to these communities, but still there are these resilient folks and I think that we were able to showcase their stories, which are of this moment and which are making tremendous change is also a part of our film. Mm -hmm. Now, who do you, what are you hoping as, as we talk about the timeline of this coming out in September, um, being weeks away from the major important election, what are you hoping that the person who is going to watch this, hopefully socially distanced, <laughs> Um, um, what are you or their local drive-in <laughs> or the drive-in? I'm so happy that drive-ins are coming back. You don't know, like, you don't even yeah. understand. Um, so what are you hoping that the person who you know drove their family or their friends to this drive-in to watch this film? What are you hoping they do or think about once they, you know, once the credits roll? Well, I think there are two things. I mean, like I mentioned before, there are those, you know, responses I see on social where people are saying, you know, what is the big deal? You know, you just register and you vote. Are people lazy? You know, blah, 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 like this language around voter suppression. If we, if those folks will watch, I think that they will understand the dimensionality of this issue um, and open up their hearts a little bit um, and their eyes to what has been happening in this country. Um, the, you know, I'd say for other folks who are, you know, predisposed to believe that voter suppression exists as it does, um, I think, you know, I think that the film will inspire some righteous outrage. Um, we're not gonna change anything between September and uh, November in terms of access. We're not gonna be able to change ID laws. We're not gonna open that polling place back up, um, but we are gonna encourage you to know your rights um, to know about provisional ballots, to know what your if you're voting, uh, doing a mail-in ballot, to know what your your uh, deadlines are, and you know what, unfortunately, to stay online, you know that's in what it's going to take, and to invoke, you know, to to make sure people see the struggle that has gone into the fight to to for people to be able to cast that ballot, and that that righteous outrage will will keep you there that day and make you check uh, your deadlines and just be involved in our national in our democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things that um, 
you know, that struck me as well as always in these conversations, when we're talking about voter suppression is the role that poll workers, um, those who are either volunteering their time or sort of working for that small stipend because, you know, poll workers are not getting paid lots of money, folks. Um, and how they end up um, operating in that standpoint. There was, I think, a, a poll worker, a poll worker who's just, you know, I, he was surprised. He was like, they've they've taken my some of the machines that's supposed to be here, you know, that even the people that are working within this system are surprised as to why certain decisions are made in the way that sort of hamper people from from voting. Um, and that's a, a, another uh, piece that I feel is always missing in the, in the discussion is about these people that are your neighbors, are, you know, um, uh, live in your community, who have elected to be poll workers and still operating in this system that also restricts them. Um, did you in your research or even in the discussion sort of have any discussion about that? We didn't really delve deeply in to that, but what I can say is there is a tremendous need for poll workers mm -hmm. and we have uh, a very dynamic uh, site that we've include, we've created for the film. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called allinforvoting.com. And we highly encourage people to get involved and to go to the site and to find out how they can become a poll worker. Um, and to, I mean, like, this film made me fall in love with democracy again. Democracy is not the, the sexiest thing to, in many ways, to fall in love with, but it is. It really is that shining ideal um, that we must embrace and we must protect. Okay, so we have. Um, I want to move now to. There are some folks who are watching. Hey, folks, um, who are watching our conversation um, and have uh, questions as well about the film and about uh, the both of you. Um, and there's one question from Lindsay, um, which is, uh, she would love to hear your hopes for the impact you hope to have with this film. Well, I think you know, I was talking about it. I think from from folks across the spectrum, it's it's to open people's eyes about voter suppression. Um, you know, right now we hear a lot from the gov the White House about voter fraud, fraud, and um, you know that that is the rationale for all these ID laws and for these purges that happen. And um, and in fact, there's really not uh, evidence that voter fraud occurs on any scale that affects. Um, the turnout of an election. I mean, I think when, well, you know, President Trump claimed that, you know, 3 million people voted Ill illegally in um, 2016 in his election, when in fact, you know, he, he, he developed his own blue ri ribbon panel to study it. And I think they found less than, they found 1300 cases across the nation. I mean, a really small number. So it's really a, uh, a red herring. Right. And so I think it's for one, one, you know, to show people across the spectrum, you know, what is voter suppression really about? Who is it harming? And to inspire that that outrage that's going to get you armed with information that's going to make you check your family's red, you know, call them, make sure they know if they're registered, where their polling place is, what their mail in ballot deadlines are. Um, and so I think it, it's just about, you know, it's been such a fight, you know, for, for people to be able to cast that vote. And we wanted to inspire people to hold that right dear and do the work to make sure that they can safely participate in our democracy this November. Uh, there is another question from Elizabeth and speaking to, um, I believe Lisa, your comment about falling in love with uh, democracy, um, that democracy isn't um, the sexiest thing and whether or not we can make democracy sexier. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think we need to realize this unique freedom that democracy offers. And in that, find the sexiness. Like, let's make democracy sexy again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my pledge. Um, because as we look at the loss of democracy, we see how tragic that is. And we see, and we know what the other side of democracy is. 
Nobody wants to live in a fascistic state. And mm -hmm. the, the undergirdings of democracy are so important for our progress as a nation and as individuals. You know, and I'll, and I'll just to, add, to piggyback on that, I mean, you know, look at what happened with Flint and their water supply, right? And and the, how long folks had to go with without clean water. Um, you know, it's just one example how when politicians um, do not feel like they, they need those communities to vote for them, how they can be discarded. Um, and that's really why we should be concerned about democracy, about having people's voice counted because it keeps communities in this country healthy Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in all ways. <laughs> um, so, yeah. All right, we have another question from Mary. Um, I believe is, what is the one thing a concerned citizen who is registered and already has a plan to vote can do to impact this election? Well, they first should check to make certain that they are still registered. A lot of us take, think that we are, and there might have been an unintentional removal of our names. Once you've checked that you're registered, you then need to call your friends and family and have them check to make certain that they are also. I, I mean, these are like simple steps, but and then you make a plan. You make a plan with your community about how you're going to go and vote. And then, I mean, there's further engagement that you can make. You can, you know, if, if you go to allinforvoting.com, you can learn how when this film is available on September 18th, you can have um, parties you, and invite your community to come and see this film, to learn this history, and also to learn what you can do if you feel that you have become a, a victim of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. And I think there are so many great volunteer uh, opportunities this election because for so many people, they're going to be casting their ballots in a different way. Um, you know, so people need that information. Um, you know, where what is there? Where are the drop boxes in their community to drop off their their mail in or absentee ballots? Um, so you know, getting involved on a state level um, and calling people up. I mean, people. You know, folks used to go door to door. We're not going to do that this year. Um, but you know, there's it's a new way of voting for a lot of people. So volunteer to get that information and to call people up and make sure they have a plan and they know what to do. And again, on our website, allinforvoting.com, there's different ways that you can do that. If you're, you feel healthy and you want to volunteer to be a poll worker, we really need poll workers. Um, so I think there's a lot to do, um, you know, that could involve a few phone calls or could involve a few days of work. I think that's really important and um, great for Mary uh, for having a vote plan. Um, we definitely love that. There's another question from Jem Jewell, um, uh, who is grateful for uh, both of your work um, and that Brian Kemp's obvious conflict of interest calls the legitimacy of the Georgia election into question. Does the film address this? I can tell you, watch the film. No. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I can answer that simply and, and, and say yes, that definitely. But it, did you have any additional things to add? Well, I think it was important in the selling, telling of the Georgia election in 2018 of kind of, you know, Brian Kemp is a secretary of state and he's also the candidate running against Stacey Abrams. And, you know, there was a... a, a, a you know, he's the umpire and he's the, the ref. I mean, like there is so many lines that were crossed and, and, and in keeping so many intentional infractions that happened as a result. Yeah, and I, I think it's important, as you, you mentioned, sort of his dual role in there, it, it, and it didn't stop after the election. Um, because they came after <laughs> the campaign after the election as well. But Liz, you wanted to jump in? Oh, no. I mean, it, you know, it's there in the film and it's pretty mind blowing that, you know, you're running for, you know, governor. It's a pretty big job. And, um, you know, you don't recuse yourself from being the person who's making the rules of the game. Um, like Lisa said, you know, it's like you're the, the ref, um, but you're also one of the teams. So you get to make the calls that will be a little easier on your team. 
Um, it really, really shouldn't work that way. I think it's pretty obvious. And uh, yes, we do address it. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking yeah. because so many people work so hard. I mean, it, it's just, it's not about Stacey Abrams. It's about the, the people of Georgia who, yeah. um, who were uh, affected. Yeah. And we see the consequences of that um, from from that, even in the um, how the state is governing and handling the COVID crisis. Let's take Fran's uh, question next. Um, what would you both say to discourage disempowered voter who has little faith um, in the process because of uh, their history of trying to participate in the process? You know, um, in the film, you know, Stacy says it herself, you know, if they, you know, if your vote didn't matter, they wouldn't be working so hard to take it away from you. Um, so it is about, you know, inspiring that righteous outrage of like, wait, what? You're going to take that away from me? That's mine. <laughs> you know, we want to inspire that sense of ownership in people. Um, but look, yeah, a lot of people feel disaffected out of the conversation. Um, but, you know, again, it's like, if you vote, then you can kind of be part of creating the conversation or taking that little step to, to, to getting those conversations to happen. I mean, look what's happened with the movement for Black Lives. Um, you know, conversations now about, you know, police and funding are happening in a mainstream way, right? You know, that wasn't happening one year ago. Things can change for communities. And, you know, the vote is just one piece of that. Yeah, I mean, Fran, I think it's a great question. And as Michael Waldman from the Brennan Center in our film says, you know, progress takes time. It is slow. At times it is glacial. But, you know, last night when I watched Kamala Harris, I knew that, you know, the dreams of my parents, of the people who met the Billy Clubs, who met with the KKK at the turn of the century, you know, the dreams that started in 1619 with our enslavement here came, are, have changed dramatically. And so that is where hope and faith shows up to, to see that these moments and that we are at a, an important time with the recognition of the contributions of people of color and women to this, our system. And I think that, uh, that, that resonates really strongly about not feeling that things are just the same as they've always been. Mm -hmm. We have one last question from Marit. Um, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up this conversation. Um, but the question is, what was the most shocking or surprising thing that you learned from the film? I think I uh, talked a little bit about this in the beginning, um, but uh, for those who are just joining in, did anything shock you or was this all information you knew, um, you just wanted to sort of package it in a way in which people would understand the depth and the breadth of this problem? You, I mean, look, it, you know, what, what, what I'll tell you what is a, a surprised me is the efficiency of these laws. I mean, let's talk about, you know, Shelby versus Holder um, in 2013. As, as I talked about before, you know, after Barack Obama was elected in 2008, and I think there were, what, 15 million new voters participating mm -hmm. in our democracy, a huge expansion of the process. It's a very beautiful thing, um, you know, and uh, but then, you know, what happens is, you know, the Supreme Court case of Shelby versus Holder makes it way makes its way to the Supreme Court. And all a lot of the progress of the Voting Rights Act is destroyed in that in that one decision. Within 24 hours, states were ready with laws written to go to their legislatures to restrict the right to vote. Texas had a voter ID law ready to go. Um, Ohio's got purging ready to go. I mean, there's just the, the, the efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. And and, you know, in, and we talk about, you know, the indigenous, the Native American vote, you know, requiring that you have a street address um, to participate in this democracy when we know that on reservations, that's not uh, what's happening for those folks. So the hoops that people have, the efficiency of getting people out of the system that politicians don't want to answer to. It's breathtaking. And there is a sequence in the film that that, you know, looks across the country in sort of like a 10 or 15 minute swath of what happens. It's like a monster movie. The monster pops up in heads and then it just takes over your country yeah. and you watch it and it's fast and it's efficient. 
And that, yeah. and, and, and that efficiency is, is, is terrifying. Lisa? I was just saying it's the Hydra, you know, you cut yes. off the head and the head pops up some other place. Um, and uh, I think the, you know, what the, there were certain things that happened in the Dakotas with the native uh, community that allowed for the elections there. And then immediately it's like, okay, you need to have a street address. Well, when you live on a reservation, you don't have a street address, you have a PO box. So, you know, it was like the, the rug is pulled out like mm -hmm. immediately. And um, look, happy to say that there is some interesting things that's happening for recourse now but still it takes time to reset and to find the resources to do that resetting. Yeah. And the onus is on the people. The onus is on the people to find their way back into the democracy, not on the government to make sure citizens can vote. You know, one of the most surprising things when I do civics classes and trainings and things of that nature is when I tell people that they don't have a constitutional right to vote. And people will argue you down. Yes, I do. I have a like, no, you don't. <laughs> like, it's not in the Constitution. And so if we had a constitutional right to vote, if it was there, that burden shifts. Now the burden shifts from the individual in terms of registration or changing laws or finding out and things. Now it shifts. Um, and the burden has been on the state, on the government in terms of how they are creating this process. Um, but, you know, it's to that point that people you know, believe that this is something that's mine that I have control over in terms of my vote um, and not really, you know, knowing or understanding that it is granted to us um, by the state and they create, and you talk about the efficiency of oppression, it is very efficient. <laughs> um, not only in voter suppression, but in um, uh, perpetual poverty, economic oppression, all of that is very efficient in terms of keeping um, certain people in power um, and maintaining the status quo. So that's all of the time that we have, unfortunately. Um, but I want to give um, one more um, minute for you to uh, pitch and talk uh, about the September release of All in the Fight for Democracy. So September 9th in theaters, whatever that looks like, and drive-in. <laughs> and uh, September 18th on Amazon Prime, um, allinforvoting.com for resources. And uh, there's an education guide coming. We have content that is weekly and on message for the moment. So it is very alive. Um, and we are all in and we're making democracy, we're dating democracy. We broke, some of us broke up, but we're, we're <laughs> democracy again. Yeah, what, what she said. Um, thank you for, <laughs> for, for joining us and, and, and listening. And we just hope you, you dive into the film because um, yeah, I think there's a lot there that a lot of people just, just don't know about our history. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank to all of you for joining and sharing the conversation and make sure to tune in and watch it and also share and take action after you've watched it. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.